Hi, everybody. And let me just say my experience with fiber reinforced composites actually goes back quite a number of years when I actually was in Finland looking at the northern lights and I got a chance to go to Turku, Finland, meet, I would say, the, the, the leaders in the field of what we're talking about today. And I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, this is a must have. You're going to see why this is a must have in all of our practices. I thought it then, which was probably in 2017, 18, and I couldn't be more enthusiastic about presenting this today. So I really just like to crunch as much as I can into my 45 minutes and I respect your time. So let me just take care of that and we're good to go. So for decades, we have been using fibers in dentistry and they continue to allow us to reinforce teeth in multiple ways and obviously including post today. Well, given all that, this course really is gonna take us in a whole new direction. And what we're really talking about is really everyday applications. And I think more and more are gonna come out and you will see that this will actually replace some of the things that people have been doing for years, which are more complicated, putting like, let's just say, and I'm not negative on this, like a ribbon bond and other materials, they've had their place. I'm just all about what Pete said earlier, what makes things easier and more efficient, but also really, really conservative. So let's talk about this because many of you don't understand the concept in the sense of what is a short fiber reinforced composite. So we've been using composites obviously for 20, 30 plus years. And what we have now are glass fibers that are placed in a variety of orientations. They could be vertical, horizontal, parallel, or they can be cross-linking. And that's what we'll be looking at today with cross-link glass fibers. And these are E-type fibers. And these are meant to be used in load-bearing areas, AKA posterior teeth. So typical of what I like to do is I like to blend research into the clinical. I got plenty of clinical. But the research, this is really, again, crazy. It goes back really two decades. So this is not something that is just a new hot topic. These have been involved in dentistry 20 plus years. So the studies have shown that these short fiber reinforced flowable resin composites, because today we're gonna talk about flowable resin composites, exhibited higher fracture toughness and higher flexural strength comparing to conventional composites. Now you think about, and Hugh said this, all the occlusal load bearing that we're talking about every day, can this in fact prolong the life of direct restorations or as cores over endodontically treated teeth? And to me, it's all about dentin replacement, true and false question, not enamel replacement, it's a dentin replacement. Okay, so one approach could be in a thoughtful thought of biomimetics. And we're gonna use it in a biomimetic composite, composite structure. And it's gonna be in a restoration that includes both a short fiber reinforced flowable composite as a base, which I'm gonna show you cases. And then you put your capping agent, your hybrid composite over the top. So that doesn't change. But what we've been building up our teeth with have been hybrid composites or flowables, why not raise the bar? So the studies have shown that this biomedic approach will increase the fracture resistance by increasing a much better favorable failure mode. And again, this allows me to preserve tooth structure. And I'm gonna show you our first case and it's gonna be a thought provoking case because I'm trying to prevent teeth from fracturing. So can we prevent teeth from fracturing in a sense with this new biomimetic approach? So I wanna relate that clinically 
but keep thinking flexural strength, fracture toughness. So this was a new patient who came into me and I was her third opinion. She's 35 years old. So she's got pain. I can't believe she's going around Chicago getting third opinions. I mean, I just would want to get out of pain. So let's take a closer look at this. Let's get into a little bit of thought process. Pete, in my intro, this is what all my courses are about. How do I keep teeth till they're 75? And there's your typical bite wing. We took a CBCT. I'm not showing it because I don't want to get into CBCTs on this. I haven't taken an FMX in seven years. Everything is bite wings or a PA and a CBCT. So I, I, the, CBT, the CBCT showed a bifurcated canal and great bone. So you know you've got a tough endo ahead, but great bone. So if we save this, we may need crown lengthening. What would you do if this was your mouth at 35? What would you do? What does traditional dentistry tell you to do? I have so many people out there who say extract implant. I couldn't disagree more with that. I've been doing implants since 1993. There are so many issues with implants that everybody likes to avoid talking about. Two biggest issues, obviously open contacts are a huge issue. And when you have open contacts, you have proximal issues, neighboring teeth, and then also subsequent potential bone loss. And then when you take out a tooth, you have tissue shrinkage, some subsequent bone loss. So there's so many things that I believe obviously in implants, but I also believe in saving teeth. And this tooth is totally sal salvageable. So we decided per my recommendation, don't go the implant route. And the first two opinions were go implant, take out the tooth and go implant. And I totally disagreed with those first two opinions. It's just my thought, but I wanna save it. So of course, the CBCT with a bifurcated canal, I'm not doing that endo, that's going right to the endodontist. And that's one of the beauties of CBCTs. No surprises, start diagnosing. So you don't have surprises during treatment. I would not wanna do this. This is microscop microscopically driven <laughs> endodontics. Okay, now what are your options now for restorative treatment? Traditional, post core and crown. And some of you will say, well, that's what I would do. Or a crown buildup in a crown. Or a DOFL composite slash anacore buildup. Those are your three options at this point. At least that's how I would look at it. And if you put 30 dentists in a room, we'd get pretty much, I would say at least, uh, they would fill this blue, purple, and green option here. So let's take a little bit deeper dive. Let's go black and white for a second. So which will last longer? A direct restoration or a crown? You could say a crown will last longer, potentially than a direct restoration. But if you say a crown, does that additional tooth removal jeopardize the long-term survival of the tooth itself. She's 35. So if you put a post and crown, whittle the rest of this tooth away, will that tooth last 40 years and get her, get this tooth to the age of 75 in her mouth? And that's where I often go far more conservative. And I, I think my patients understand my appreciation of what's best for them. In no way am I saying, a crown is malpractice or a crown is below the standard of care. Absolutely not. But I'm looking at long-term survival, not of the restoration, but of the tooth itself. Does a direct composite then add longevity to the tooth's life expectancy or does it decrease it? And these are the questions you have to be asking yourself. Hugh shows his beautiful redoing of his smiles and redesigns. Love all that. 
This is my everyday world of patients walking in with this clinical situation. And then you go, is this tooth half full or half empty? And the fun part is, and you're gonna hear from Ron later, and he's all over wine, and he'd say, keep boring. Is the glass or is this tooth half empty or half full? If I choose to go direct, how do I best restore this tooth? And how do then we minimize fractures without full coverage? How do we increase adhesive bond strengths? How do we decrease micro leakage? How do we decrease, in a sense, how, how do we increase longevity? So let's go now into a little bit of research so we can understand a little bit more about what we're looking at. So here's the clinical situation. And now I'm gonna go into the research and look at the fracture resistance of treating endodontically treated teeth with a fiber reinforced composite. Not sure what just happened to my control. So hang on a second. Hang on. There we go. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the fracture resistance, which is what we deal with every day of root canal filled teeth with a fiber reinforced composite. This is Everex posterior. And what it did was it went through five different groups with the primary focus was, was it better to use a fiber reinforced composite? And here's what's amazing from this study. And this isn't an internal study. Let's go back. This is a study. And I just, I do want to show you this. That is six years, now seven years old, and absolutely having nothing to do with GC America or the, the company making the posts or the composites, I should say. They, their, their study showed there was no significant difference between Everex posterior treated teeth, filled teeth with a capping layer versus an intact tooth. So now if we can restore teeth, rebuilding a tooth back to almost the same fracture resistance of a natural tooth, this is a game changer and this is why this is essential in all of our practices. So let's go back to reality and what are the essentials to understanding how best now to treat this bicuspid everyday dentistry for everybody. First off, the band must be 100% stable. So when I'm teaching my courses and I'm doing my hands-on and you're using your sectional matrix bands, the band must be for absolutely fully stable. If there's any movement in it, when you're burnishing, you'll get an open contact. You must feel the adjacent tooth. So you take your burnisher and you should feel it as you're pressing the sectional matrix band. The wedge must not interfere with the emergence. So this is like a pearl to me. If you have a short tooth, and oftentimes these bicuspids are short, especially on lower anterior teeth, and I believe I'm using a garrison wedge, which I find, I love these wedges. It's crazy you can love a wedge. You may have to shorten the height of the wedge, not the width, the height of the wedge, just with the burr, like a finishing burr and then reinsert it, you should be able to feel the emergence from the gingival margin. Just wanted to make sure we're all clear. You wanna feel the emergence from the gingival margin. Okay, the preparation. I wanna go into the canal and I wanna make sure I've removed enough gutta percha so that I can create an adequate seal. I wanna bevel all my coronal margins and usually I'll use a typical football finishing burr. Could be a yellow or a red. Hugh touched on this. I believe wholeheartedly every endodontically treated tooth should be micro etched. Every one. Why? You've got cement in there. You've got gutta percha debris. So after you're done prepping, you're going to micro etch 
the rest of the, the preparation. 15 second total etch. And now I'm gonna place my universal bonding agent. Won't get into universal bonding agents in this course, but it's pretty much all I use. And why? Because they bond to everything. And because they bond to everything is essential when I'm repairing zirconia, Emacs, an old composite. When I'm bonding to metal, they bond to everything. So routinely, with a bonding agent universal, you're going to scrub it in for about 20 seconds. And I'll say routinely, I may scrub it in longer. But here's the key step. So you've etched, you've bonded. And now I'm going to use an air-only syringe. And I want to be clear here. If you use an air-water syringe, you are bringing water back into that preparation. So now you have instant micro-leakage. So what I do with my air-only syringe, I go from a distance, and I'll air from a distance, and then I'll come closer with more pressure and continue airing. Airing to me is 10 seconds. There is no such thing as a two second air dry. And that's the number one reason for post-op sensitivity. You just blast your resin away. Obviously you're not gonna have it on an endogenously treated tube, but you wanna lightly air dry from a distance and then come closer and complete air drying for another five seconds. So now you've got an isolated area and I have always believed in self-leveling flowables for the gingival box. And in this case, I'm just gonna show you Sureflow SDR Flow Plus. I've been using this product for, I don't know, since it launched and now it's a Flow Plus. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna inject it along the margins of the, ging the gingival margin. You're gonna wait about five seconds and let it self-level. Are there others on the market? There are other great products on the market. And I just believe in doing equal play. Extra base from Voco, beautiful bulk fill from Shofu. These are all self-leveling flowables. Self-leveling flowable means it's just gonna level. It's not gonna, it's not gonna really pool and it will flow. And that's the key. So for me, I wanna make sure my gingival margin is just totally covered. And these are obviously oftentimes bulk fill, so you can go up to four millimeters. Routinely, I don't. In this case, it's one millimeter max. But as you place this and you let it self-level, now the light curing becomes essential. And you have to understand that to cure this flowable, again, we haven't even gotten to short fiber <laughs> composites yet. You've got to cure this so thoroughly. And when I say 30 seconds, I want everybody to realize that when you're curing a flowable because it has more resin, it takes longer to cure. So curing this 10 seconds, it's going to leak. It's going to leak. Curing it 20 seconds, I don't know if that's long enough. So air longer, meaning cure longer. 30 seconds for me. Second thing. Second thing for me is routinely dentists are not paying attention when they're light curing. So you want to have a uniform beam. We'll get into that in a second. You want to cure straight down, then come from the buckle and the lingual. Rotate your light. Why? If your light misses a buckle line angle or a lingual line angle, six months later, a year later, you're going to see a brown line at that margin. Why? Because it never cured properly. So 10 seconds straight down, then another 10 from an angle, another 10 from an angle. And you're never going to hurt the tooth doing this, but you're going to maximize your bond strengths. Now, so let's say here's the cured flowable. And as you're doing that and you've cured it, there are other options. So one of the other options is you can place the same flowable or other flowables, whatever you like, just to cover the gutta percha. Why? Because you're creating that seal. Because when you start either placing, let's just say a fiber composite, what we're going to talk about, or even a bulk fill uh, core buildup material, oftentimes you may see a void right over that gutta percha. So I have no issue you putting a little bit more of 
SDR flow over that, a G and Eel flow, any kind of flow you like right over that gutta percha. But here's the secret sauce. The secret sauce is we want to minimize fractures on this too. So now I'm going to inject, and this is EverX Flow Bulk. And I'm going to place the syringe tip all the way down, and I'm going to inject by pulling it up slowly. As I do this, okay, it's directly being injected over the SDR along the proximal walls, and it is meant to be placed in no more increment than four and a half millimeters. So at this point, I've placed my Everex bulk flow and you can see with the black arrow, you can still see the SDR. I'll take a micro brush and I'll actually just pack it in and let this self level, it will level out. So I'll take a little micro brush, usually I'll dip it in a resin type material with uh, no solvent, like a Fortify from Bisco, and I'll just dab it, just pack it in. Then I'll inject more and reapply my micro brush. The key is I wanna leave room for the final hybrid composite. So I wanna routinely leave millimeter and a half or two millimeters, hard to judge but that's what your goal is. You gotta have more than a millimeter, that's my, that's my view. So again, you're gonna inject it, let it self-level a little bit, pack it in with a wet micro brush or a slightly moistened with like a resin bonding material and then light cure. This is from Ron, I just wanna show you how the material flows in. You've, it looks like a Vaseline, but when you cut a crown prep, it's amazing how it integrates right into that margin. This is shown via our smart mirror technology. Now you got to light cure this material. And again, don't under cure. Yes, it's translucent. Yes, it's a bulk fill. It's going to be 30 to 40 seconds. And I'm going to use my multiple directions because you could have undercuts. Don't just come straight from up to down absolutely multi-directions, cure everything. Now, let's talk about shrinkage. I think shrinkage is important. So this study was done under a confocal laser analysis. Again, this was done recently, obviously this year, based on 2021 or last year. And when you look at a fiber reinforced composite, compared with conventional composites, these have less polymerization shrinkage stress, therefore less gaps. This becomes critical. This is probably the potential of the unsung hero here. So if you have less shrinkage stress, more resistance to fracture, now you're starting to understand the biomimetic approach. So in these two diagrams, I'll show you this slide where the green arrow is now pointing at the Everex flow. So this is the core layer. You see the, all the little microfibers cross connecting, minimizing fractures, minimizing and maximizing flexural strength, minimizing marginal gaps and decreasing shrinkage and shrinkage stress. The final layer is your final composite that's placed over it. So imagine now you're doing a large class one and you want to minimize, you've got a thin marginal ridge. If you have less shrinkage stress, can you protect that marginal ridge? I often will adjust the occlusion off that marginal ridge. But now if you use this biomimetic approach and then I'd be using Everex Dentin, with less shrinkage stress, you may be able to preserve those, thing, those thin marginal ridges. Whenever I take off my sectional matrix band, I wanna do a post-cure proximally. 10 seconds on the buckle, 10 seconds on the lingual. Why? You're never gonna hurt that resin by over-curing it. I wanna make sure I'm having every angle covered to maximize my curing. Then we get into the complexity of finishing and polishing. So 
Again, I just want to walk you through this. Electrics, I'm at 50,000 RPMs. And I'll usually use my yellow finishing diamond burrs and my white finishing diamond burrs. That's how I'll adjust occlusion and get my initial finishing done. Just a close up. I don't like red because red is too aggressive. Routinely, it's yellow grit and a super fine white diamond. Proximally now, still at 50,000 RPMs, I'll use a needle nose yellow and white type burr. And these are needle nose burrs. Now I'm gonna shape my, do my final shaping and removing all my excess flash. And I love the super snaps. These are from Show Food. And the reason they have no score is a lot of the other discs have a metal uh, internal structure. So what happens is if you're composite, if you're finishing and the metal of the burr hits the composite, you score it and it makes it black. Then you gotta go back and repolish it. There is no metal in these. So I start with the black and I usually do it at six or 7,000 RPMs because it's coarse and it will remove flash. Then I'll go up to 10,000 RPMs and then I'll do purple, green, and red. And that's how I finish my proximal line angles. Ultimately, there's my final contact. You can see the final contact isn't in the incisal third. It literally emerges from the gingival to the middle to the incisal third. I want a nice, long, broad contact here. That's all based on proper wedge and matrix placement. Now I'm looking at it from the occlusal. Here's your rebuilt by cuspid. She's 35 years old. Is the tooth half full or half empty? Would you want your tooth restored like this, rebuilt like this to minimize fractures, minimize shrinkage stress, how long now can you preserve this tooth? Obviously, she's got a brush and floss, but openly, this is how I keep teeth till their 75th birthday. You don't have to all agree with me, but I like to be thought provoking in how I take care of our patients. So, what is Everex Flow? What is it? So, the concept is this is a short, this is a composite with short fibers or small fibers. And it's basically reinforcing the composite to give you higher flexural strength and increased fracture toughness. There are two types. One is a bulk fill. It says five millimeters. I'm sure it's good for five millimeters. I go four and a half, don't go more than five. And then there's a dent. It's a more opaque dent in color. And that's a two millimeter format. When I'm rebuilding endodontically treated teeth, I use the bulk. If I want to do a biomimetric approach and just rebuild the dentin and use the capping layer, I would absolutely just use the dentin. It's more natural and it's a, it's a better cosmetic result on natural teeth for me. These are 25% filled with fibers, 30% resin, giving it the flow, and 45% with filler particles, that's the blend. So when you look at an SEM of the material itself, you can see this is a composite whose particles are fully covered in a silane coating, which is very important. But you've got all these glass microfibers cross-connecting. And this is what increases the reinforcement of the composite itself and I think adds a huge new element for all of us when we're doing composite cores. The silanization is very, very important because what happens is you get an impregnation of the fibers with the resin, and this improves the stability and prevents water absorption. And this was done, this study was done over 15 years ago. And Garushi has, has really spent his career really all about fiber reinforced composites. This is from GC America, and we're looking at fracture toughness. And when you look at fracture toughness versus flowables and bulk fills, including sonic fill and extra fill and others, 
it's really all about increasing your fracture toughness. And it's not like a little bit. This is quite a bit when you go from a level of 2.88 versus a 1.58 or a 1.72. So this is incrementally, I think, very important. Our second case is Elvira. She's 72 years old. and She comes in with a fractured ceramic crown. And you never know what you're taking off. And crazy as this was, it was built up with IRM. I took out the IRM. And this is what I have left. So now the question is, what do you do here? What do you do here? Do you post or do you no know post? So how do I evaluate whether I'm putting a post in or not? I really look at the feral effect. And the feral effect becomes really, really important to me. I want to move this cursor over. Hang on one second. Great. So when we look at posts and feral effect, will a post add retention? Do I need to put in a post? And, and do I need it? And the only reason is for retention. So let's look at feral effect. Looking from the occlusal, I'm looking at the proximal internal amount of two structure left. I'm looking at the internal amount of two structure left around it. And I've got plenty of internal feral effect. I've got plenty of external feral effect. So to me, do I need a post? No, I really don't need a post. And I could use a traditional core buildup, but here's the beauty. You see this all day long. Do I post or do I not post? Now it's short fiber compo reinforced composites. I measure, I'm eight millimeters down. So now I know I'm gonna have to do it incrementally because it's maximum five millimeters. I think you already know the answer. So I'm gonna do a total etch. And now again, I wanna be clear here. I have micro etch. I'm gonna go in and remove the entire debris. Hugh is 150% right. Micro etching will absolutely uh, increase your bond strengths. It's absolute. The studies really go, the size of the particles, Below, the, I think, uh, size 40 become irrelevant. So whether you're using a 27, a 29, or a 40, I, I'm really not concerned. Now I'll start my bonding. So I've etched, rinsed, placed my bonding agent in. And again, with my bonding agent, I am going to scrub this internally and externally. I'm going to do both. So again, I'm going to bond, I, I want to bond the entire thing. So again, you're going to bond internally and externally. You're going to air dry for 10 seconds at a distance, then go closer. And now you're going to light cure. I want my light as close as possible to the preparation. And I'm going to again, angle it. Why? Because you're going to have undercuts. So you're going to air dry, as we said, and now you're going to light cure again, 30 to 40 seconds, multiple angles. And everybody asks, what do you use? I'm a Velo guy. I have four of them. There's one in each operatory. I've dropped them so many times and they don't break. I'm not asking you to throw it at a wall. They don't break. But that's not the only reason. I right now only have grands and the, and the Velo grand has a much bigger lens than the traditional Velo. But the key is collimation. Velo was well ahead of the curve. Now it's Velo grand for me. And the collimation allows a consistent curing at greater depths. When light is not collimated, you lose a tremendous amount of energy. Most lights are collimated. If you're using an old light, that's questionable. Most lights are collimated today. And the other thing that Velo has always shown is great beam uniformity. And why is this important? Because even though the light is going in all directions, you want to make sure the beam is uniform in strength. And there are so many lights that do not have good beam uniformity, which means they're not getting an even curing. So those are the three key features of why I continue to be a Velo guy. Uh, the little brown thing is on my uh, mirror, and I apologize. So this is the first layer 
of my Everex being injected uh, into the tooth. Again, remember it was eight millimeters in height. Now the second layer. So curing 30 seconds to 40 seconds, the first layer, because it's at a distance and it's far away from your light. The second layer, 20 seconds. Why? It's closer to your light. And there's the Everex flow bulk. So this is my final preparation before I place my second cord. You can see my initial cord. I've not placed my second cord. Again, it's pretty much a chamfered preparation trying to maximize retention. Itero scan, and I'm in bicuspid occlusion on this. So Itero scan, bicuspid occlusion, marginal details, printed model. I cut off my temp. And now I'm going to get to micro etching my prep. Hugh said it. It's in every course. If I can micro etch my preparations, I want to do it every time. The problem with micro etching, it creates bleeding. So what routinely I do is I'll take off the temp, and then I'll, I'll place this LC blockout resin. This is from Ultradent. It's what we build up our, you know, how we make bleaching trays. And I use the same material. I'll just inject it around the neck of the tooth and you need to light cure it. Then I micro etch because I want to minimize bleeding. Again, I want to minimize bleeding. If it bleeds, I'll show you what I use on my last case today. delivering the crown. If my crown is too tight, routinely I'll check with floss, which is what we all do. I never adjust until occlusion, until I make sure my contacts are ideal. If my contact is not ideal, it's too tight here. I take the crown out. I put a piece of articulating paper in. I slide the crown back down. I then can identify exactly where I want to adjust the crown. And routinely, again, it's with a yellow finishing burr. A red is too aggressive, and I want to do it at 50,000 RPMs. Try it in again. If it's still too tight, it might be on the mesodistal floss again. Take your time. Because the last thing you want to do is create an open contact. The last thing you want to do is have a short margin because it didn't seat fully. So again, after this, I'm going to place it back in the mouth floss. If it's still tight on one of the areas, I, re I redo the exact procedure until it's just snapping in ideally. These are also from Ultradent and these are their zirconia polishers. I don't love them intraorally because they can flake off intraorally, extraorally, I get a great finish. They're ideal to be used with water. Again, a reason why I love electrics, you can use a slow speed electric and get water. So all I'm going to do is it comes in two grits and I'm going to get my final finishing. And now we get to what cement to use. And it was very interesting listening to Hugh about his choice of cements. And when I evaluate a case and I do far less smiles, I've done so many smiles in my life, but this is my everyday dentistry. And I look at four things. Do I need additional retention? And I really didn't. If I need retention, then I bond them in. So I had good retention. Second question, can I isolate the area? And the answer is I can isolate the area. I'm not worried about saliva coming in from all over. But my margins are subgingival, which means you're going to have gingival cravicular fluid. And if I'm going to use a pure resin cement, could it be contaminated? And that's a question I ask every time I cement if I'm subgingival. Then the third question, the fourth question is, can I remove the, the excess cement without a hassle? I hate hassles. And it was, the answer is yes here. So my choice of what I do is I love RMGI cements. We have two in our practice. One is from Voco, Marone Plus QM, and the others, GC's Fuji Semivolve. And I can't control, I wanna understand this, if I can't control the environment, I'm absolutely going to use an RMGI. Why? Because it is moisture tolerant. If I've got subgingival margins, it's moisture tolerant. But I have to have adequate retention. Have to. 
Now, I, I have to say this. I go off label. I use a zirconia primer, and I'm pretty much all zirconia. Hughes Emax or dilithium, and I'm pretty much all zirconia because there's so many gorgeous, and I'll show you the next. There's so many gorgeous zirconias out there. I'm, I, I have no issue with zirconia at all for anterior layered with porcelain or posterior like this. So what's my technique? You're going to micro etch the inside of your zirconia crown, always micro etch. I'm going to clean it with IvoClean or ZirClean. Studies show to do both. You're going to put IvoClean or ZirClean in for 20 seconds. You don't have to scrub it. Just put it inside the crown after you've micro etched. Micro etch, IvoClean or ZirClean for 20 seconds. Rinse, air dry, and then I'm going to use my Z-Prime. I've used Bisco Z-Prime for years. I think it walks the walk of a zirconia primer. How long? Five to 10 seconds, air dry and air only, no air water, air only. Don't bring any water into this. Why do I love Evolve? I, honestly, it's what I underlined. It's moisture tolerant. It's moisture tolerant. Now I've already micro etched the, the preparation. Now I'm just gonna do a final cleaning. Again, what you said with a, conces a concepsis type uh, cleanser. And then I just load the crown with a valve. I wanna see the cement extrude 360 degrees. Who cares about the bubble? It's in the cement. You wanna make sure the cement is fully extruded 360 degrees. And the beauty is then you tack here. Now, when you tack here an RMGI with a Velo light, which is high powered, even in their standard mode, you can go five seconds and it's still this easy to peel. I love that. Now, there's a very important thing here. When you use a valve or other RMGIs, I wanna create no bleeding. So all I've done is tack here the lingual and the buckle and I peel. You re-tack here, Interproximally now, the distal and the mesial, you retack your five seconds. Why? Because if you floss and that material is not cured, you're going to create potentially some bleeding and now you have instant micro leakage. So I'm repeating buckle lingual peel, recure proximally for five seconds each area. And then you can either use a scaler or an explorer, peel it out, or gently place your floss and pop it through. But you want to make sure you're, you're using your floss or a scaler when you've cured your proximal cement. Final curing. I will, after my RMGI has cured, I will still go around all my margins for an additional 10 seconds on the lingual, 10 proximal, and again, 10 buckle. And this is the, this is the beauty of zirconia today. My last case, I want to be cognizant of time. Sorry, I'm a little outside and a yellow jacket's flying over here. Okay, this is Pat. And many of you know, I'm very much involved in geriatric dentistry. And how do you get involved in geriatric dentistry? I've been in practice now 35 years. All my patients got old. And that's what I deal with. They all got older. So now this is Pat. Can you do me a favor? Would you take that away so I can not get stung by this yellow jacket, that would be great. Okay, so Pat is 87 years old. This will look good on the, uh, you, yeah. She's 87 years old and she had a recent stroke and her doctors don't want any surgery. No surgery at all, no crown lengthening, no extraction, nothing. But the problem is she has pain on this too. Right? Here's geriatric caries, 2018, look at the distal, no caries. 2020, I got a lot of carries. Send her to the endodontist and the endodontist can only go find the part of the mesial canal. Everything else is calcified. But the most important thing was, the most important thing was she got out of pain. I don't know how that one thing did it with the mesial canal, but she got out of pain. Now the crown's off and you can see I've got nothing left, nothing. She wants her tooth, she wants her tooth. So this is typical what you often find with geriatric dentistry. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, again, micro etch the area. And now I am going to create some bleeding. So I'll walk you through this. You micro etch the area. And before I place my pins and bond, I'm going to just scrub the area. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to, I'm going to, scrub, I'm going to scrub the area with the stringent X. It's all I use is a stringent X. Why? You scrub for 10 seconds, rinse, it stops bleeding. Say it all. All our patients bleed when you're getting too close to their gums. So a stringent and X. And openly, I, all the other products in the market, they do work, but I just find a stringent and X with a scrubbing motion for 10 seconds. This is the must have in every practice. I place three pins in. I'm using 10,000 RPMs. Again, electrics. I can't imagine a practice without electrics. Three pins are in. I know you're going, Lou, they're just pins. Well, this is all I got, gang. This is geriatric dentistry, and I have to be MacGyver. So now I don't want to etch, total etch. I do not want a total etch because I'm going to create more bleeding. So in this case, I'm using a, a distinctly different self-etch product with a universal bonding agent. So I'm going to use peak self-etch. I'm going to scrub for 20 seconds, creates no bleeding whatsoever. I'm going to then air off the peak self-etch and then apply peak universal. Many wonderful universal bonding agents that have self-etching, but here I want to maximize. And the best way to maximize is use a distinct different self-etch within the same formula of peak. So it's peak self-etch for 20 seconds, air off, scrub your peak universal bond all around and including the pins, 20 seconds and again, 10 seconds of airing. Light curing, I've got a light cure rotated because you got a light cure rotated all around the pins. Okay, I wanna cure all the surface of the pins. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rebuild my gingival margin first. So I'm using g and Universal Injectable. I, I either use this product or Shofu's, Shofu's Low and No Flow Plus. And I would use their Low Flow in this case because I want it to flow over the margin. So in this case, g and Universal Injectable. I feel it just flows, you can guide it, comes in all these different colors. I couldn't care less about the color in this case. So. If I'm curing the gingival margin, I'm going to pick a light color. Why? The lighter the color, the faster it cures. So now all I'm doing is aligning my gingival margin because I'm going to raise my margin, and you'll see that in the final crown. So I'm just lining the floor. I'm going to light cure 20 to 30 seconds, and it's a light color. Then I'm placing my EverX Flow bulk fill. One big layer. Let it self-level, let it settle down a little bit. I like five or 10 seconds. I really don't have to manipulate it at this point. It's a bulk fill. Now I'm doing my final preparation. After my diamonds, I go to final, what I call fine diamonds, because I believe the margins have a much better chance of success against micro leakage having fine finish margins. If you use a coarse diamond, then your margin's coarse. So I, I finish everything with fine finishing diamonds. And these are the robot burrs uh, from Shofu. I'm gonna create bleeding. Again, astringent in X is placed. I know you want crown lengthening. I can't do crown lengthening. I just can't based on uh, the medication she's on for her stroke. So again, scrubbing for 10 seconds, rinsing. And I'm going to take my final impression. So there's my formula, A1, G and Eel on the margins, raising my margins in specific areas. I'm not going to be on tooth structure everywhere. And the bulk is a fracture-resistant material called EverX Flow. And when I'm finished, here's your, Ever, here's your G and Eel injectable. It's more translucent than my EverX bulk. And my final crown will show my margin is raised right here. So my composite 
mar my margin is on the composite, AKA a raised margin. I wanna thank you all for allowing me to share some of the latest materials and techniques to ultimately preserve more pulps and equally to place this fiber reinforced composite and it allows me to maximize the long-term restoration. And that's how I look at this. How do I get the most out of my teeth? 